Not giving up on an America that works for all, Angela Glover Blackwell believes local policymakers can still make good decisions, even in an age of Trump. Indeed, it's more important than ever that they use their local policy tools. Is progressive policy possible or a pipe dream? This week on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. A movement is not a flash of light. It's a flame, a torch passed from one generation to the next. So wrote the poet Maya Del Valle. Their words treasured and lived by our next guest, Angela Glover Blackwell. Throughout a career in philanthropy, research, and advocacy, Blackwell's been dedicated to using public policy to change communities and lives. Under President Obama, she served on the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. She started PolicyLink in 1999 as something she calls a Research and Action Institute. It works with policymakers, especially in the areas of health, housing, transportation, education, and infrastructure. In 2013, with PolicyLink, she collaborated with the Center for American Progress to write and release All In Nation an America that works for all. Welcome to the program, Angela. Ever so glad to have you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Just reading that introduction, the Obama administration already feels like a very long time ago. And on a planet can, in a distant place. Can you compare <laughs> what you were working on then with what you feel you're working on now? It is hard to compare. Under the Obama administration, we were struggling and fighting to try to make progress, but we had a partnership with the White House, lots of people who were in it. There were initiatives that we had been fighting to get for years that were finally beginning to take hold. Now, everything is closed off. And if it's not closed off, I find that I and my colleagues are afraid to even touch it because we don't think anything good is going to come out of it. The contrast is just completely stark. Yeah. We moved from an administration that was trying to overcome decades of neglect in local communities and struggling with inadequate resources to partner with people in local communities who felt they had wisdom about what needed to happen to now an administration that is at odds with everything that we believe in, shutting down, taking away the safety net. It is awful. So is all lost? All is never lost. All is never lost. You started off talking about our moment. This is our moment. It is going to be our moment. The good news is that we actually had found each other across the spectrum of those who were working for social change and inclusion before this administration came in. And we are having to step back from the things that kept us from being completely united because we were nuancing this or we had a priority that was slightly more important. We now see that we have to get behind those who are being attacked at the moment. We have to get behind a few common ideas. And so it is our moment, but we're going to have to struggle to make this moment about progress and not just resistance. We've got to be in a resistance mm -hmm. mode, but if all we do is resist for a number of years, we will have slipped far back. So how do we make progress? And maybe more importantly, where do we make progress? I mean, as somebody said to me the other day, Washington is like a gorgon. We need to look away and, and, and focus elsewhere. Um, in the cities, in the states, in your neighborhoods, where do you see the greatest opportunity to, to claim this moment? for making some kind of progress? Well, the organization that I lead, PolicyLink, has always been grounded in the struggles and the campaigns and the ideas and innovations in local communities. And we found, especially under the Obama administration, that we could look to Washington to be able to build on that wisdom. I want to look away from Washington right now, but I can't afford to do that because we have to protect what we have achieved. We have to resist awful things happening. and. This is a time when we can return to our roots, return to our roots of innovation in cities, return to our roots of understanding the struggles across geographies, from rural communities to declining suburban communities to inner city communities. And as we do that, we will come up with strategies that we'll be able to get into federal policy at some time in the future. But right now, I think that the hope really comes from seeing local communities 
stand up. Uh, the sanctuary movement is really thrilling. Looking at local communities decide that they are going to protect all the people who live in their jurisdictions, whether they are residents or with the, all the residents, whether they are citizens or not. I think that the people who are leading local jurisdictions are finding that they have real common ground with advocates, that they have been spending too much time pushing against. I think that some of the innovation is going to come as we create ways to fight the federal government. And I think fighting the federal government is not a bad thing at all times. I think the federal government is there to be able to serve the people, but it is a system that only serves the people when the people make demands. So, so cl to clarify that a little bit, because mm -hmm. for progressive people, particularly people who came up through the civil rights movement, any undermining of the principle of respecting federal rule is dangerous. It takes you back to eras of states' rights which never worked for civil rights if you know what I mean. I grew up in the civil rights movement and I know that the federal government did not come running and embracing the civil rights movement. Sure. It got pushed to uh, embrace the civil rights movement and it needed to be pushed even more. So when I talk about having to push the federal government, I'm just saying that I think that during the Obama administration, those of us who would call ourselves progressive and activists didn't push as hard as we would have if somebody else had been in that White House. And so I think one of the positives that's going to come out of this negative moment that we're in is a revitalization of democracy. And democracy needed revitalization. That people who understand that it is that tug and pull with the federal government, with local government that actually leads to good policy solutions, need to get back in that, that pulling and that tugging. I think that across the country, we're letting those people who are almost professionals decide how democracy is going to work. I think the people are taking it back into their own hands. They're saying, you professionals didn't exactly know what you were doing, and we're going to help you learn what it means to have your ear to the ground, to be in community, understanding the struggles of people trying to raise families, that the divides that have been fanned by our politicians aren't real divides when you actually get into community and talk with neighbors. So give us some examples. You do a lot of work on the question of equity, what is it, and what models if you have, do you have of doing that work that goes across people's, you know, across divides or apparent divides? Mm -hmm. When I use the term equity, I mean just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. Equity really looks at the outcomes that we want for people and it backs into what the inputs need to be. Um, when we think about this extraordinary inequality that we're experiencing right now, equity is more important than ever. I think that equity is the antidote to inequality. If we really create a space in which everybody is able to reach their full potential, we are pushing against these extraordinary disparities that we have seen. But this notion of equity is one that really pushes against the notion of a zero-sum game. Equity is not a zero-sum game. Zero-sum meaning if I, have some, if I have more rights, you'll have fewer. Mm -hmm. It is not about that at all. What it is about is by making sure that everybody can participate, everybody benefits. The example that I use to make that point is the example of those curb cuts in the sidewalk that are there because of the advocacy of people with disabilities in wheelchairs, mm -hmm. who even as they gain rights, uh, civil rights, could not really realize those rights if they couldn't physically get around the communities that they lived in. Mm -hmm. So through their advocacy, we got those curb cuts. But how many times have people been pushing strollers and not had to pick those contraptions up? Workers had their burden eased when they're pulling wagons and pushing carts. How many times have we just been trying to catch a train and we were able to do it because of those curb cuts? And something else we know is those curb cuts save the lives of unencumbered pedestrians because they orient people to cross at the corner. Study after study has documented the lives that are saved. The point is that when we solve problems for the most vulnerable with nuance and specificity, the benefits cascade up and out. The same is true for the economy that we have an economy in which people are being left behind and the people who are being left behind the most, those who were formerly incarcerated, those who are recent immigrants, those who haven't been able to get the benefit of a robust education. If we focus on those people who've been left behind, 
were disproportionately of color, by the way, and becoming the majority very rapidly. If we get it right for those who are being left behind, the economy improves. We know that if we close the wage gap between people who are white and people who are of color, the GDP would be $2.1 trillion higher. So the benefits are extraordinary. What we need to do is to begin to embrace this notion that we really all are in this together. An example is transportation. Transportation is one of those things that we take for granted if you have a car. For people who don't have a car, they are dependent on public transit. Public transit is used mostly by people of color. 60% of the ridership is of color. People who are low income, without cars, often family struggling, women raising children by themselves, totally dependent on public transit. When we invest in a good public transit system, though, not only do we help those people who can't get around without it, we help employers mm -hmm. because their employees are getting there on time. When those systems go to the places where people live and they run during the hours that people need them to run, there's less absenteeism. People are getting to doctor's appointments. People are able to participate in the civic life of community. Investments in public transit while serving those who are, uh, don't have cars often benefit everybody, including the climate, mm -hmm. because we know if we get people out of cars, we have that as well. So this notion of equity and the curb cut really ought to be animating our movement as we go forward. So talk about the particular American experience, and we don't have a whole lot more time, but as I listen to you, I think, well, what a lot of people say is that other countries, like the, the Scandinavian countries, are able to convey are able to achieve the sorts of policy initiatives that you're talking about because they have this sense of all-in nation because they're more homogenous nations have been historically, getting less so. People will say, you know, the New Deal went through because it mostly benefited white people. The war on poverty less so because it was going to benefit people of color, single moms of color, you name it. Insofar as, and maybe I'm grasping at straws here, but insofar as we never finished that work, and perhaps we didn't because we didn't really want to grapple with the legacy of racism and white supremacy in America. So we hoped that everybody would just come along with this kind of deracialized version of social services and what's good for you is good for me without us really getting into it. Insofar as maybe we sidestepped it, does this moment where it's kind of life or death for us um, with respect to our public services, whether we do believe we're an all-in nation or whether we buy into the demagogues setting one group against another group for their own interests, even to the point of cutting programs that benefit the very people who voted for Trump. I'm thinking some of these medical programs that he's cutting off that serve his voters in Mississippi and Alabama when they can't get doctors. I'm talking too long, but is it this kind of moment? I mean, is, is it the kind of opportunity that I'm describing in this kind of moment? Because otherwise, you can talk all in nation all you like. He's talking just us nation, and he's got a lot larger megaphone at this moment. The history of the United States of America has been the history of racism and race. And until the country comes to grips with that, it is not going to realize its full potential. But it has become, it's gotten to a moment where it's going to fail as a nation. This will be a failed nation if it doesn't overcome the legacy of racism. And let me tell you why. We are becoming rapidly a nation in which the majority will be people of color. Since the summer of 2012, the majority of all babies born in this country have been of color. Now the majority of all those under five. By the end of this decade, by the end of 2019, the majority of all children under 18, and by 2030, the majority of the young workforce. We have become a nation in which the fate of the nation is dependent on those people who have been marginalized and discriminated against. The fate of the nation is dependent on what happens to people of color. If people of color don't become the middle class, there'll be no middle class. Therefore, while we have failed to live up to our moral obligation as a nation to do right by others, we have moved beyond morality and it's become an economic, a democratic, and a national imperative. Now, I hope that people will hear that message because we're going to become a nation majority of people of color, whether people deny it or not whether they hear it or not, that's what we're going to be. And I think that this moment that we're in right now 
awful as it feels in terms of pitting one group against another, lifting the voices of hate right up into our living rooms and to the top of the agenda, I think this is the last gasp. And while that last gasp can be shrill and dangerous and even long, it is the last. We are moving to a different place. And I'm hoping that because we have had the contradictions sharpened so much because of this last election, that people will find each other and find what they have in common. I'm starting to speak at rural summits now and to talk to people in rural communities. It has always been a part of my, uh, my talk because I know that the issues in rural communities in many ways are the same as inner city communities, nuanced differently. And you've got to pay attention to that nuance. But the issues of transportation and broadband and access to healthy food and access to jobs that pay living wages, these are fundamentally the same issues. We have to find the language to talk about equity and inclusion. We have to paint a picture for people that is not frightening, but one in which everybody will have a place and be respected. And we have to understand that, just as I've said, we're not going to get on the other side of race until we go through race. We're not going to get on the other side of this ugliness that we're in right now until we go through it and we got to go right through it and we've got to be strong we have to be positive we have to grab the people who want what we want along the way come out with more people than we went in with but it will be okay but we've got to fight to make it okay yeah who are you inspired by in all of this I'm inspired by the people. I'm inspired by the people. I'm inspired by the people who were here and not documented and going about their lives. I'm inspired by the creativity of those people who when they send their kids to school don't know if they're going to be there when they come home. I'm inspired by the kids who go to school, try to pay attention. I'm inspired by those who are getting the brunt of our hate and standing up and saying, we're here, we're going to be here, join me. Mm. Angela, thank you so thank much you. for coming in. It's great <laughs> to talk with you. Angela Glover Blackwell, you can find out more about PolicyLink at our website. Well, you heard it from our guest. We're not going to get on the other side of this ugliness until we go right through the middle of it. And that sure feels like where we are. Check out this latest video from PolicyLink on why this is our moment and how our communities can come out with more than we went in with. The protests are growing larger and spreading across the country. The Occupy Wall Street protests in the financial district took a dramatic turn this weekend. New York grand jury is about to investigate the shooting of another unarmed black man. Their purpose was to peacefully disrupt what they see as the routine of injustice. Step, move, walk. Witness moment transformation to movement forward. An elder recently says to me, this is a protracted struggle. If we didn't believe we could make a change, we'd still be slaves. We have to continue the fight no matter what. A movement is not a flash of light. It is a flame, a torch passed from one generation to the next. And every so often, we're blessed with moments where the smolder transforms to blaze again, and we're forced to race down the path of progress, step, Move, walk, witness, moment, transformation to movement, forward. It has spread steadily and far beyond Wall Street. In 2011, a coalition of thousands shut down parks, city halls, banks, universities, the Brooklyn Bridge. The 99% occupied our TV screens and minds, a sizzling, static, electric spring. Step, move, walk, witness, moment, transformation to movement, forward, 2012. We saw a bag of Skittles become weapons hoodie become funeral shroud. In 2014, a toy gun turned grenade. Black bodies considered bomb threat, while silver badges shielded murder saw Ferguson burn and Baltimore rise. Now we watch as a new generation breathes and declares black lives bulletproof, beautiful, radiant, priceless, necessary. Step, move, walk, witness moment, transformation to movement forward 2014. 
In the southwest, our own iron curtain, a fence all steel, a wall all concrete, barbed wire, knife edge, cut down by dreamers who dare to defy silence, declare crossing a man-made border does not make a human illegal or alien, who say to this government, this too is my America, I will not be rendered invisible. Step, move, walk, witness, moment, transformation to movement forward, 2015, across the country, love is finally constitutional, can no longer be legislated, mandated or measured, and a commitment between two humans cannot be subject to religious interpretation in a nation built on religious freedom. Step, move, walk, witness, moment, transformation to movement forward. In Seattle, Los Angeles, and New York, the people who keep our cities afloat, the working poor, working daybreak to dust, grasping onto a disintegrating American daydream, demand their labor be compensated with a wage they can thrive, not just survive on, and minimum wage no longer equates to a marginal existence. Vote to give millions of the hardest working people in America a raise. Death, move, walk, witness, moment, transformation to movement forward. 2015, in New York City nail salons, Asian women bend in manicure over prayerless hands, inhale unholy chemicals that cause cancer and miscarriages while their daily bread is stolen. Now they gather in numbers, a call for justice and safety that is finally being heard by lawmakers. Step, move, walk, witness, moment, transformation to movement forward across the country. The decriminalization of marijuana means we don't lose brothers and sisters to a prison system intended to keep them there. In California, Proposition 47 reduced felonies, let loved ones come home to communities starved of their brilliance. In Dallas, a 14-year-old Muslim boy is accused and arrested for making a bomb. A simple hashtag becomes a call to action, and we stand with Ahmed, not ignorance. Step, move, walk, wake up. Our right to remain in slumber has been revoked. Silence and apathy are now the only crimes. Watch how every breath is a dance of dissent. Every race fist an act of resistance. Witness this moment in history turned blaze again. Every moment the flame is growing. But will you be the fire this time? Will you be ember? Will you be catalyst in combustion? Will you claim the torch? Two months into the first Trump term, top Democrats in the money media seem obsessed with the administration's putative ties to Vladimir Putin. And here was I, thinking the White House ties to mad misogynists and the KKK were going to be their problem. One cabinet pick has already been dropped for having conversations with Russians rather than being utterly unqualified, and Jeff Sessions is under scrutiny for lying in his confirmation hearing. Perjury is bad, but being a pathological, racist, red-baiting, xenophobe opponent of the Voting Rights Act should have been more than enough to disqualify Sessions from becoming Attorney General. New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman has compared alleged Russian hacking to 9-11 and Pearl Harbor. The Obama administration, concerned about Russian meddling in our politics, seems to have done everything it could to greenlight the leaking of secret intelligence, which should be a scandal in and of itself, shouldn't it? Unless we think that using national intelligence for political purposes is okay as long as they're the right political purposes. That'll never come back to haunt us. Just about everyone has a stake in keeping the obsession going. Everyone, that is, except for we, the public. Hillary Clinton supporters get to blame Putin for her defeat in November. Democrats get to put off considering what, apart from Russians, might have swung the election. Trump keeps the focus on himself, his favorite thing. And the Republicans, well, for as long as the public and our media are pondering possible Putin crimes, the longer we're distracted from all the two real crimes coming down the pike against sanity, ecology, and civil society, thanks to new GOP laws and practice. Let's not forget that both the U.S. and Russia have nuclear weapons. I don't know, I just thought it might be worth a mention. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists moved its doomsday clock half a minute closer to doomsday in January, the closest it's been to the end of humanity since the birth of the arms race. Ratchet up the Russophobia too far, and it could have some unfortunate consequences. I'm Laura Flanders. Write to me. Tell me what you think. Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. And check out our website for all of our archives and information on how you can subscribe to our free weekly podcast. Thanks. I'm Laura Flanders.